Welcome to Accelerate Your Wealth, a podcast by Rebecca Robertson, founder and director of Evolution Financial Planning. We hope you enjoy the show and please feel free to leave us a review. It really does help. Feel free to connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram or head over to www.rebeccarobertson.co.uk or our sponsor, Evolution Financial Planning for regulated advice on www.evolutionfinancialplanning.co.uk forward slash podcast. Today joining me is Jo Davidson um, and she is a lovely friend of mine. I've known Jo for many years and what I love about Jo is her honesty and how authentic she is. Um, I've never known her to be not not very like she's always positive um I've never known her to be the one that's moaning about people or saying something nasty behind someone's back and there's some of the some of the stuff you can see that happens online you never see her really involved in any of that drama and I that's that's one of the reasons why I love Jo as a person but she's also a successful money and business mentor speaker and author um, and she's also a happily married mummy to four kids. I know, she's crazy. She's got four. I don't know how she manages it. Um, jo has recently created or um, a She's a Money Boss Academy, um, which she is now used, uh, used by men, women all over the world to remove their bad money habits, unleash their inner money boss and set themselves free. Jo is an example of how anyone can achieve success in their terms, regardless of their starting point, as long as they're willing to put the work in and follow a proven success. You can find her on www.she's-a-money-boss.com. But let's get talking to Jo and find out all about her story and where she started and her great successes and what she's achieved in business. Hi, Jo. Hello, Rebecca. And where are you, Jo, in a hotel? Well, I am in New York at the moment. Oh, so posh. You sound such a jet setter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, I feel like a jet setter. But as you know me really well and you know that normally I'm in the UK in Essex. <laughs> <laughs> as jet setty <laughs> I'm yeah. here speaking at an event so um yeah amazing well I loved did you did you enjoy the eight hour flight of peace and quiet with no children do you know what I felt a bit guilty because when I got there I thought oh dear what am I gonna do normally because I've got a little one my life for the any plane flight is Peppa Pig putting out arguments what's the next bit I can do to entertain you let's color this in and I was like what am I gonna do isn't that really silly as a woman where we're like what am I gonna do for eight hours totally get it I managed it you know I watched two films I had all this work I was supposed to do but I was like let's just watch another film shall we <laughs> yeah why not my little boy is the first time my little boy he's gone away to his grandparents um once before and it was two nights and um, this was I don't know can't really even remember months and months and months ago um and he's nearly seven and that's never that's the first time that's ever happened with any parent or anyone so he's always been with us really yeah um and he loved it by the way he wasn't bothered um and this time summer holidays at the moment as I record this he's away for a week so this is he went on Saturday it's now what day are we Tuesday and I'm scared and he's not like ringing he's not interested nanny <laughs> sending me updates and I've just loved um I, I, I do miss him um and I do have an older teenager with me but and I'm having to run her around and pick her up from work and like, you know, getting her nails done and all that, all that shenanigans. Um, but it's just another level of quiet without this other big, quite big plate to spin. Um, and it does, does, oh, I can't believe the headspace it's given me and the clarity that it's given me and the calm <laughs> that it's given me that I'm only having to deal with well effectively I call my husband another child so I'm only two children rather than three children um so yeah I, so I totally get it and then I, I but I'm not I'm not feeling guilty for just sitting for hours just you know listening to podcasts and reading I'm reading like two or three different books through Audible at the moment and then I'll put on Grey's Anatomy and listen to that for a little while and I'm just not feeling guilty about it at all it feels amazing whereas the rest of the time if you do get like some spare time I'm like, oh is he watching too, has he watched too much telly should I should I have taken him out a little bit more or oh, it's terrible holidays I've just they're out and about doing something every day and he hasn't done anything for a few days it's, it's all that mummy guilt you know that's just so heavy and noisy 
A hundred percent. And I think being here, I've only been away a couple of days, but now I've just, as I say, done a call with um, my husband and the kids. And then you feel a little bit like, oh, hold a sec. I should be with you now. I've, I've you know, worked and done my speaking stuff. However, you'll relate to this. My 10 year old daughter, I was like, oh, I've got to get her off the phone. She's become obsessed with horses. <laughs> and as you know, you know, queen of horses yourself. Yeah. And though it's cost me quite a lot of money what's brilliant is she's off her phone she's down the stable she's learning and she is adoring it as you know it's like an addictive bug <laughs> yeah. so that's been brilliant as well but again it's quiet because you're going hold on where are you where's where are you supposed to be putting out arguments with your siblings and entertaining you um so no, yeah. great. we always say don't we the juggle is real the juggle is real and, and originally when we sort of oh, I invited you on to the, sh- the show I, I wanted to talk about the fact that you had four children and how you juggle it um and that that totally could be what we talk about may, maybe you can come back but I, I I'm conscious that actually I want to sort of talk a little bit more in a bit more depth around um your money journey and where you sort of where you've made some great massive learnings and I think that's really why I'd like to I've invited you onto the show so some other women can hear that story yeah. um but you're doing it from okay yes you have a partner there's no harm in you know you haven't got you haven't got to do it all on your own and that's okay we talk about female financial independence that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing it on your own right. what it does mean for me my definition of it um is basically I'm sorry I'm hesitating because my daughter's at the door um and she's nicked my coat and taken the dog for a walk so she's showing me with like I've got a horsey coat that's really long and a big hood and she's parading outside my front of my door um Is that's all right you need to go and check she's okay no she's got the puppy she's throwing it around she's like yes go for take the dog for a walk goodbye um oh god she's taking the other dog and this is a distraction that I'm talking about right there's this yeah, constant but noise isn't, and it good? isn't it good and you know why I love it because I used to think as a woman that we have to be perfect like we're at work and yeah. yet kids are still around yeah. and yet I used to think like oh my gosh well we we can't we can't talk to our child who walks in because oh my gosh we're supposed to be this like perfect but that is life and, I think yeah, everyone and they're not there yeah respects us more by going hey we're just and we're okay with that with that in yeah. mind I'm literally just gonna pull this across because there's people yeah. here oh okay you're in a hotel room with oh I can see the windows <laughs> people are looking and going what's she doing oh it's putting me off okay fair enough um so sorry she threw me with her dog walking coat on or my dog walking coat your on. your horsey dog walking coat yeah so that was what I was going to say about horses is that um I, I, I it's an amazing amazing um opportunity for particularly like my daughter and the type of person personality she has she has a lot of energy um she's a high perfectionist and I just don't know what she would be doing if it wasn't for horses um I don't know what kind of person she would have become um if it wasn't for horses especially with lockdown she wasn't on her phone she was down the stables all day every day um and it was a walk from home and it was you know so lockdown for her wasn't not even wasn't really a bad thing she got out of doing school so it was like a holiday for her as far as she was concerned and so horses are a massive blessing but they were also a massive financial strain and you know she's had two lessons this week we've got camp next week Um, and I'm not massively into um I'm, I'm I'm only like putting my toe in in comparison to what you know how far it can can go um yeah so good luck you need to become a multi-millionaire um no not just a millionaire um so yes yeah, it, it, it's it's, a, it's a, a, a lovely gift um but it's it's never ending um and Emily's been riding since she's five and she's 15 and it just the, the growth and that development that you find in life and business it's the same you're just scratching the surface with when you first start start out, it's like a whole other world. Anyway, I just I digress. Um, we could just do a podcast on talking about mummy horses. That maybe that that's another show for the future. I can come back anytime you like. <laughs> well, we could just do that in the pub together. Yeah, we could do that. That sounds good. When you're back from New York, darling. <laughs> yes, darling. <laughs> so your story. Does, let's just stop, go yeah. to, back a bit. You've got four children. I do. And your oldest is. So my oldest is 18. So I have 18, 16, 10 and 3. Wow. Like this is going to be a round of applause just for getting through life and 
<laughs> surviving. And I've met your oldest a few years ago now, your son, and I was really blown away by his, I guess his mental agility would be a good word for it. He just seemed mentally really switched on. Um, and that's hard to get a teenager into that sort of frame of mind, that growth mindset. That's that's not easy to do because they're always very close with parents, aren't they? Mine just thinks I'm crazy and mental, but I actually think secretly underneath there's like a little bit of, you know, this is listening maybe 5% of the time. Um, so where did you, where were you when you had your first 18 years ago? Was you working? Was you employed? Yeah, I was. And to be honest, I really think that's an important part of my story and also of women's stories who want to um, have a business or a job and have children. Because I was at that stage where I had just started my business with my husband, we had a business together, and I was working really hard. And I kind of, it was, we were getting success. Now, of course, success means different things to different people. But on my terms, success was happening, except I was like a duck. On the surface, I appeared this very successful woman in my terms. And I suppose to other people, there were people who would have looked at me and gone, oh, she must be, she's successful. But my truth underneath, I was paddling like mad, like the duck, just trying to kind of cope with it. So I was 29 years old when I had him and I had no idea how to run the business and be mummy. No. Literally, I had at the time we had a chiropractic business and I was a chiropractor and I'd arranged locums for his due date so I could take you know some time off for maternity. And he came six weeks early and the locum couldn't come earlier. So I had him six weeks early. That was a shock. Um, and literally within two weeks, I was back to work and oh. he came with me. Luckily, we had a, a very busy practice, but people had been with us for a while and we knew them and we had great people around. So often he'd come in and be around in the center, like patients holding him, but waiting for their turn. Steve would be there or I'd be there. It was literally past the baby. <laughs> um, and yeah, I didn't know how to get out of it because the business was badly designed. If I wasn't there seeing my patients, I wasn't earning money. And I hadn't yet, yeah, I'd prepared everything for six weeks time yeah so I went back then um I just knew then hold on a sec mental health wise I really feel like it's not talked about enough we say the juggle is real and it is and I by the way I think the juggle is real even if you don't have children I think if you're trying yeah. to run a business do a job you might have family that you're looking after you might have animals that you look after yeah. um you might have friends you want to see I think you know we're navigating through life and really it really affected me in ways I just didn't even know. I just did it because as women, often we just do, we just get on with things that, you know, and I men do too. We're not here to be anti-men, but, but no, obviously no. we're talking to women. Um, anyway, then um, I put, all I could do then was just push myself back into business. I hadn't changed nothing. I thought it's okay. I could just carry on as I am. And I see this with many of my clients and I'm sure you see it too. They're going to have their first baby. They're like, it's going to change nothing. And you think, I'm not going to say anything, but actually it's better if you do think it will change things and we can plan for that rather than, oh. anyway. Then nine months later, I found out I was pregnant with my second son. Oh. And when he arrived, I still tried to do the same thing. And literally I just smashed into the wall of burnout. And I didn't even know that's what it was. I literally went into work and thought, I can't do this today. I had a list of patients. And I just sat there sobbing at the computer, looking at this list of patients, thinking, I have nothing left at all. And it's no one else. I don't know who I thought was going to rescue me. The fact was, I was not prioritizing my own self-care in amongst it all. And it was a pattern that would follow me a lot with business until I had to break the pattern. And the pattern got broken with a different incident. Um, I don't know if this is answering your question of how old I was when I had him, but it was in the context of, it doesn't matter what age you are. For me, he was, I was 29 with him. And then my last one, I was 43. And I must say, it felt easier at 43, even though everyone told me, you know, my gosh, it's, you're, you're older. older. You're not older now. <laughs> yeah, but I designed the business better. Yeah. And so actually, I didn't even feel like I was working, but I was still earning just as much and working much less because yeah. I designed it differently. And that's what I love to let's, share. Let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about that then. So what, you know, as much as you're comfortable sharing, um, yeah. And what you must have so many learnings in in all of that. And I can re resonate with so many things that you, you've talked about. Like I was um, 
14 weeks pregnant when I was made redundant from my job and my first for my first child so I was sort of thrown into business in, in the financial crisis of 2008 and you're sort of you, you're left with very little options and then my second child um I organized everything so I could take time off I had six months maternity leave um and I handed it over to my team to be looking after certain parts of the business and I would oversee other parts and I came back to no clients booked in no sales no pipeline and you know just very very little really going on um so I tried to get everything right and I put it all I spent months you know the whole nine months prior it was a planned pregnancy to get it right and it still went wrong and so there was a massive again some big learning there um so now I took my financial qualifications mine in a nutshell is I took my financial qualifications and now I look after ongoing clients so I have a revenue that comes in on a monthly basis or an annualized basis or a quarterly basis to look after clients and at the moment I have about 75 clients um and I'm paid to, I pay paid to look after them so if I take a three four weeks off as long as I look after those clients within the right regulatory regime I could take two weeks off and I'm still getting paid for those clients so everyone has a different story around what passive looks like um, and that's just in a nutshell, my example. Um, I did try and do lots of other things. I did like at one point I had a membership it was a separate regulated, like it wasn't my regulated business was a separate thing. At one point I had a membership, I had courses, I had a mastermind. And I just felt like all of it conflicted with my core role of looking after those clients in several, several different ways and guises. Also being online all the time, I found draining and I didn't want to do it all the time. So I shifted and actually I'm a lot happier and the juggle is much easier now that I'm not trying to do multiple things. Yeah. So I've learned loads in that process. I've learned tons about marketing and about me and my business and what I enjoy and what I don't enjoy. enjoy. So in a nutshell, that's like my little version of what you're going to share with us. So what happened after you, you know, after your second, what's his name? Is, is it Charlie's? Your Louis. No, so Louis. Harry, Louis, Alice Rose and Emilia. Where did I get Charlie from? I don't even know. I feel like you should have a Charlie. Charlie was in the shortlist. Charlie was in the shortlist. Maybe we discussed like that. that all those years ago. <laughs> no, yeah, I like that name. It somehow suits you. Um, so Lewis, did you say, or Louis? Louis. Louis. So what happened in the business then? What 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 did was it a quick thing? Was it like took years to sort of cultivate to make the shift from then when you had your youngest now? Yeah, to be honest, I think for all of us, we know what I'm about to say is true for all of us in that when you don't have things in order sometimes the universe without sounding too woo woo will deliver something to you that makes you listen yeah and that's what happened to me I went back to work luckily we have brilliant parents in the sense of my husband's parents and my mum particularly are around and I couldn't have had those boys and lived life in the way I did if they weren't literally as close to us as they are. But yeah. on the other side, and I'm going to say this, I don't want to sound ungrateful to them because I am so grateful. It, it almost enabled me to carry on like a steam train in the other yeah. areas because they were picking up a lot of the slack. But right. inside, I didn't, I wasn't being the mummy I wanted to be. And that made that whole feeling of like, hold on, I'm not being great at work. I'm not being great as a mummy. Anyway, to cut a little bit of a long story short, one day I had an episode where I dropped the kids off to nursery and I must have been feeling under pressure, but I didn't feel stressed. I just felt normal. And my little one, Lou, was crying and I had this moment of, hold on, I have no choice. You have to go in. And he went in and I sat in the car and sobbed going, this feels awful. Because I know kids every day go into nursery, they cry when they leave their parent and then they're fine. I get it. And I knew he would be because otherwise I would have had to have, you know, but in that yeah. moment, I, I, you've got no control here over the mm -hmm. fact that your inner guidance system is telling you to say, actually, you know what, today he just wants to be with mummy. So we're going to be together. So the day started like that. And then I had this checklist of what's successful people do I must go to the personal trainer so I went to the personal trainer try you know go overdoing things then I was like oh I'm gonna oh I haven't listened I haven't meditated right let's get that in by the time I got to my office on this particular day I had like a low-grade headache and I felt peculiar is the only way I can describe it and I went into the office and literally I was like right back to back calls with clients because I was doing mentoring and coaching we'd exited um like the 
um, hands-on chiropractor. Yeah, sort of exactly. Um, and I just was that better though. Was that better? Sorry to interrupt. That's a transition a lot. A lot of people would like aim for. They're like, okay, I don't want to be the hands-on speaking to like actually um chiropractor or an actual therapist I want to coach coaches was was that an easy transition for you well to be honest I didn't actually plan on that transition I think what happened was um we were doing we, we became pretty well known in our industry for having something that at that time people, no one else had really done particularly in the UK we've managed to be growing a business and I'm just really careful because I think I'm messing up my timeline slightly yeah. um I'll come back to the how we did the coaching in a moment yeah, in terms yeah. of this wake up. Yeah. I, anyway, so I sat in my office and I was on the phone and or I was about to go on the phone and my eyes started going all blurry and my husband was working away and he happened to message me and I said, I feel weird and my eyes are blurry. And um, he went, oh, OK. And then I was trying to I said, I'll mess I'll, I'll messenger you. And I was typing, but as I was trying to read the words, the words were like, I don't know what these words mean. And I just managed to say to him, can't type or something. And he messaged me back. And because we had a medical background, um, he went, I want you to go to A&E. And I was like, because in a previous life, I, was a, I did a degree in nursing, I'm a chiropractor, I spent some time at medical school. I knew really that if it had been someone else, I'd have said the same thing. But in this women's space, I hadn't got time to do that. So I said, it's okay, I'll be fine. And I had my first client, she's still a client to this day, actually. And I said to her, I'm, I've got to turn my camera off. And I thought, I'm going to have my headset and lay on the floor in my office because I just couldn't sit up. And she's a, a real talker. And in that particular session, she was reporting back what she'd implemented. So she didn't need me too much. I laid on the floor thinking, this now is what the heck's going on. Anyway, I sat up and felt like I'd been bashed on the back of the head with a like a hammer. Every and at that stage, my mum, who happened to be around, came in and she was like, oh, I need to call an ambulance. Anyway, called the ambulance. And when they got there, they said, We think you've had a brain bleed. Wow. And I was like, What? I I, I knew all the symptoms. I'd learned them all. And I thought. I haven't got time for a brain, a brain bleed. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> like, I honestly, in, I was like, no, no, I know what you're going to tell me. I haven't got time for that. But it was a mixture of massive fear, but denial, but also the realisation, I know what these symptoms could be. Anyway, then it just, I remember being in the ambulance and overhearing what they were saying, ringing ahead to the hospital. And I remember thinking, that lady's in a bad way. Like it wasn't even about then. You, yeah. oh my we were God. talking about me, but I remember thinking that lady's in a bad way. Because as part of my nursing degree years ago, I worked in AE. And I just remember thinking, gosh, shit, that lady's in a bad way. It was like I was completely detached from me. And they were talking about me. Wow. Arrived in the through the doors. It was like, you know, the, the ER program. And like loads of people running around doing tests. And then literally. I was there and this junior doctor came along and said, oh, just, you know, we're doing the test. We think you've had a fatal brain hemorrhage. Wow. And in that moment, I remember thinking, fatal? Like, and again, even though it was fear and scared, and I remember thinking, I don't want to die, to, like, today. Today's not the day I should die. And all I thought about after she'd said that to me was, I can't leave my children. Mm. And then I can't leave my husband. And then my mum, who'd followed behind in, uh, in the car, she was in the, the waiting room. I remember saying, don't use the word fatal, like thinking, don't use the word fatal for her. We don't know it's fatal. I was coming in and out of, I didn't really, I, it was just very weird, but they were on my top three things. Mm. And then it just all went completely like, I don't remember anything. And then I woke up in a room, very similar to this hotel room actually, but it was all white. And I remember my first thought being, is this heaven? <laughs> God, like, is this heaven? Like, where am I? Yeah. And eventually the nurse came in and said, you know, it's not heaven, um, and said, um, you've been here for a couple of days. And it was a real moment of in that time where clearly the doctor was wrong because here I am all those years later 
However, in that moment, I wasn't thinking about the business. I wasn't thinking about my team. I wasn't thinking about my customers or my patients. I wasn't thinking about how much money I had in the bank. I wasn't thinking about the bills I still had to pay. I wasn't thinking about how I needed to be perfect. I wasn't thinking about any of those things. I was just thinking about, I don't leave my kids and my husband and my mum and my family. And I didn't really care in that moment about anything else. I feel a little bit emotional, to be honest. And I think. Why did it have to get to that for me to realize what actually mattered? I'd lost sight of it a little bit, which is really hard to admit, especially when your kids are old enough to listen to this and hear it, because who wants them to feel like I was like this steam train for professional thing? Oh, yeah, the kids will come along. Anyway, then my husband came in and said, right, you know, you're going to have to we're going to have to change everything. And I heard it as you're going to take two weeks off work. So I kind of, I interpreted is we're going to change everything. I was like, okay, you mean I need two weeks off work? And it was like, no, 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 we've, I've rung all your patients and blah, 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 you're not going back in. So yeah, so that was a, a wake up that made me think, okay, I need to change this. However, I think a lot of women and men, but women, I hear this all the time. Oh, this health thing happened to me and I had to stop. Yeah, I feel like we shouldn't allow it to get to that place before we listen. We yeah. should listen when the first whisper comes you know I need a day off I'm tired or oh my gosh I feel a bit overwhelmed or oh my we all have those days but often we'll just soldier on through them and those days then amount to more and more and more and then a, a thing happens that the universe says right now you've got to listen anyway I've got a question so, from you on this because yeah. I completely I, I, I didn't know this this happened to you so I'm so sorry that this happened to you Joe. um mm. and thank you for sharing first of all um but I think a lot of women can resonate with it. And thank Christ I didn't have a brain hemorrhage or anything like that. But I was pushing myself in a different kind of way. Like, I don't know whether some people it's it's for external validation or it's for internal validation. And I was pushing myself, you know, I was writing books. I was going applying for awards. I was doing TEDx. I was like my baby was not even six months old and I was practicing for a TEDx talk, um, which was extremely stre stressful. Like that's, you should be spending your, uh, people saying to me, oh, just slow down, Becky. Just stop pushing yourself so hard, Becky. And I was just like this freight train, like no one could slow me down. I, and I, at the time I didn't realise what I, what it was, was going on. You just, you just don't, you just, you're blinkered to it. You can't see it, feel it, hear it. I think it only comes with either a, a serious realisation or with me a little bit of age where I've gone, Christ, I haven't got the energy for this anymore. Surely there's got to be something better than that. Um, <laughs> I haven't got to prove myself to anyone. And I, I sort of started to achieve certain goals. So therefore, I the, the itch or the drive wasn't there anymore. And I then had to ask myself, well, what is my passion? What is my drive? What, what What's next? But my question is, and I think this applies to a lot of people, do you think that it's part of the cultural shift that women are finding ourselves in so we've gone from being you know a long long time ago um you know women that stay at home and just look after the children and don't work to now not just working part-time now not just you know you know just working around the children as such um and you know a little bit of pin money a little bit of pocket money and kitchen hobby kind of businesses we've shifted into a, a, a paradigm now where you've got executive women leading very big boardroom kind of situations high high shooting high caliber roles within you know large corporate companies and business women with massive ambitions where they're retiring their husbands and they're coming to work into their business or not as the case may be um we're, we're seeing a, a massive shift compared to 100 years ago you know it, it wasn't that long ago that women weren't even allowed to have a bank account yeah. do, do you find that you know maybe in 10 20 years time we find ourselves in a, a different place do, do you do, what are your thoughts on that yeah I mean I think the thing is we know each other really well and and anyone listening to this like we both agree that women should do whatever they wish. So for example, it won't be our listeners here necessarily who are women who have chosen to be mummy at home and not work outside the home. Um, women who are high in corporates or in jobs and or business, whoever you are, I just feel like it's getting back to doing three things. One, doing what you love. 
Two, monetizing that in a way that you can get a fair exchange for what you're doing. And then the third thing is taking what you earn and we call it the gap, like what you earn versus and investing that gap. So you have total choice so that actually how you're earning money is not exchanging time for money. So if you did want to leave work and go home and be, or you, and I think that's the shift is when someone said to you and to me, slow down, I didn't resonate with that. I'm like, why would I want to slow down? Sorry, mm. slow down. My train is going because I want to go and achieve these things. I don't want to slow down. Mm. But actually it was then realizing that you can still achieve stuff, but you don't have to keep on that train. Mm. We were lied to. We we were lied to that you had to go and work hard and get a good job or get a great business. And that's how you become successful. When actually I then discovered once I started thinking about it, no, I think I've earned more money when I changed how I earned that money. Yeah. And, and reprioritized. Do you get what I mean? Someone's yeah. saying to you or me, or probably many women, listen, slow down. You're just like, yeah, all right, but that's that slowing down business ain't for me. Even no. though for me, a life event happened. I still wanted to be ambitious and achieve my dreams. I just knew I had to do it in a different, more healthy, balanced, structured way. Mm. And so I worry slightly. I think we're on a very important mission to tell women that to tell them it doesn't have to, you can still be ambitious, you can, you don't have to go. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's really important work, the work you're doing, the work I'm doing to just try and shift that. So women know that there is a different way to their success. Um, so what did that look like for you in your next phase of things? So obviously you, you didn't get to have two weeks off, I hope, I hope you had longer than that. Well, to be honest, um, I think I, I hadn't quite reformed my ways um, and I did go back in it probably a bit too hard. However, I, I had a coach at the time who I really believe in mentoring. We both believe in mentoring. You know, you know, you know, hey, you've spoken to my groups many times and brought your brilliance to them. And I'm so grateful for that because we when you have someone around you mentoring you, they can see things you can't see. Mm. So I had a coach um, or a, a guy, he, his name's Michael Gerber, and he wrote a very famous book, Beamer Through Visited. So my husband and I had coaching with him. We spent an absolute fame and fortune. But he said to me, you have to get out. Like literally, we're at a meeting, but get out. And I thought he meant like me, get out of the room. I thought, how rude. <laughs> like, I got out. <laughs> and he, went, he went, I don't mean here. I mean, your business, you've got to get out. And I was like, get out of the business. Oh, God. anyway. So um, this coincided with a big part of my, the thing that I teach now. And what happened was I'd had a conversation with my husband because I was the girl who was bad with numbers, a little girl. I remember at primary school trying to do this numbers business and like my teacher, even at the time, I remember her saying to me, you're not really a numbers person. And I was literally in lower primary school oh. and I held it and I thought, oh, I'm not a numbers person. I see. That's why I'm finding this so hard. However, I was a talker. So I'd go and sit at the back and talk, 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 talk. And she'd let me really. So I thought, oh, I'm not a numbers person. I then left, went through primary school, went to senior school with that label, you're not a numbers person, went through the whole of my, that education with that thing of you're not the numbers person. And therefore, because you're not a numbers person, you're not good with maths either. So straight away, another label collected. Mm. Did my GCSE maths and got a grade E. Mm -hmm. And no one really at the time said, I'm not being funny. If anyone else here got an E, I know you, you're a similar story. Terrible. To me. So I got an e, I'm sorry. Yeah. I know that you're similar to me. But anyone out there, you know, I thought that was my ceiling. Yeah. And then a teacher, a different teacher came along and said, excuse me, I've watched you. I think you could get a C because I needed that to do my A-levels. I'm going to re-enter you for the retake and I want you to do nothing other than work on your mindset. And I was like, sorry, work on my mindset. I'm not good with numbers. That, how's that going to help the numbers? And they went, no, 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 it's not about the numbers. You are good with numbers when you start 
thinking you're good with numbers. And I was like, you are crazy, but all right. I'm a people pleasing good girl. girl. I wish I had this person. I oh know. God. I was like, oh, I'm a good girl. I'll do as you say. I'll go and do the exam. And I got a C. Wow. And I was, like, I was like, hold on, I've done no maths. No maths learning. I've just changed. Maybe I am good with numbers. Anyway, carried on then to university. Still now thinking confusion. Hold on, I wasn't, I'm the girl who's not good at numbers and not good at maths, but actually I admit there's something there that I, anyway, I then took it forward then to the Debenham store card and credit cards and I became the girl who was now bad with money and in debt right. and spiraling out of control with it. And to be yeah. honest, the more debt I've I been got there as well, by the way, like I got in, into, I've been there as yeah. well, I'm 21, I got into a lot of debt. Yeah. The more that I got into debt, the more I put my head in the sand because I just could never see a way out of it. And I still had now those other labels, girl bad at numbers, bad at maths, bit of confusion, what mindset could help it, debt, store cards, student loans. Like that was just like, I was thinking, well, I could see the road, but I didn't know how to change it. Yeah. Then um, I did what everyone does who's bad with numbers, bad with money and in debt I decided it was a good idea to start a business because that that would be a good combination and so what <laughs> happened was I did had been at university quite a long time because I'd got confused over what I wanted to do and I did a degree in nursing first and then thought no I, I'm going to bore you with why but I ended up anyway as a chiropractor and set up the practice with my husband and completely abdicated the finance and the money to him I was like you need to run the money side of it and I think a lot of women do this whether it's oh, to a, a lot man, of women do that whether it's to a man, whether it's to another woman, yeah, whoever it is, they say, I'm not good with the money, so you should do it. Yeah. So I did that, and it was perfectly fine. However, then I was working really hard, and I wasn't seeing the kids as much as I wanted to be. I wasn't being the mummy I wanted to be, and I did not know how to change it. But every day I kept thinking, but this is what you have to do. And I was wearing all the hats in the business. I was a chiropractor, but also I was the owner. I was the HR person person we had a small team at the time all these things anyway on this particular day an incident had happened and I went into the office and said to my husband you're not paying me enough I've had enough now like I cannot what's the point I might as well go and get a job I'd earn more and work less working for someone else and I've really had enough and I'd written out my resignation of my own business <laughs> there were only two business directors me and him and I'd written my resignation I put it stuck it on the wall with a bit of blue, blue tack and I said that's it I really unless you can resolve this there's my resignation and he looked at me and he was under tremendous pressure as well because although we were great chiropractors we didn't know how to you know and we hadn't found Michael Gerber quite a bit it was all around a similar time anyway yeah and so he said to me in this little moment, you know, if anyone works with their husband or wife, they'll know that, you know, you try to keep the two separate. But in this little moment, we became like a bit of a husband and wife. And he went, all right. OK, resignation. Do you think you could do the money better? And in this moment, I was not at work. I was like, at, like almost talking to my husband. I was like, you know what? Yes, I think I could. <laughs> and I just let out this like rip of, yeah, you know what? <laughs> And he went, all right, go for it. Now, he's not vindictive. He's just a wonderful man. So he was not saying it in a nasty way, but he was under stress. And I think part of it, he felt a bit relieved, perhaps, that I was going to. But anyway, it was a mishmash of I stomped out <laughs> and I stood outside and I honestly put my head in my hands and thought, what have you done? Like, this is stupid you are the girl who can't do numbers you're the girl who can't do maths you're the one who can't do money you're the one who got into debt and he'd really helped me with my debt by the way it wasn't me necessarily yet who'd got out of that and I thought I've got to go back in and say look you're right I'm so sorry like that wasn't called for and you're doing your best you can and all right we'll just it will get better but I couldn't because I was too stubborn. I think, to be honest, if it hadn't been a conversation with my husband, maybe I would have done that. But I was like, there is no way I'm going back in there and saying <laughs> that. Like, no way. <laughs> anyway, I thought, OK, great. And what are you going to do then? Like, you have to then. You've got you, you can't carry on as you are. So I was like, I'm going to study everything. I don't want to become a financial planner or an accountant or a bookkeeper because that wasn't in my DNA. I just, I, that was not what I was. There. But I was like, you can teach yourself about money. So I, I was like, right, I'm going to read every book I can find on money, <clears throat> excuse me, every single book that I that didn't look like spreadsheets because I that was 
not my area, as you know. So I was like, right, not spreadsheets, not that stuff, but the the psychology of money, the mindset of money, the how does money work? How do we earn more money? What do we do with our money? So I just studied, 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 took courses. And that was when at the same time we took on Michael Gerber as our mentor. And he started having those conversations with me, which is you need to get out. And I was horrified. So I was in this confused state of I've got to sort the money. And also I've got to get out. How do you do that? Like, oh, my gosh. And, and how do you let go of everything that you've done, even though you're in a love hate relationship with your business and your life? Oh, my gosh. Who will I be if I'm not the stressed out wound up? Did you ever see the film The Dead? Where's Prada? Like that lady. Yeah. I think that's what someone actually told me that I was her, like her. Anyway, different story. So I was horrified. Anyway, cut a very long story short, I was determined. And I think that's the message for any woman listening to this. Don't disempower yourself by abdicating your money. You don't have to be a genius with numbers, but you have to own it. So I did. Anyway, I then went and taught myself. So fast forward a little bit later, we decided to change accountants. Michael had said change the business structure. Great. And the new accountant took over. And then a few months in, like I decided in that argument that, right, I'm going to become the boss of my money, our money, and I'm going to become the CFO, the chief financial officer. I didn't even know what a chief financial officer was, but I was like, I'm going to become one of those. And I'm going to become the chief financial officer of the business and my life. I'm going to become a money boss. I'm going to, I was, this was my mantra outside in this like rant. Anyway, so I, the, the, we're going to change accountants. But what happened is because of the strategies we've been learning, not just with Michael, but the studying that my husband and I have done, he went and studied very successful businesses and bought back the tools from them. So together we were doing, you know, reinventing. Anyway, then um, the new accountant said, we need a meeting. And I thought, that's so nice of the new accountant to come and bring us to a meeting. Isn't that nice of them? And anyway, he said, who's your CFO? And I was like, it's me. He said, well, you need to come. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to come anyway because I'm the business owner. We went into the meeting and his face was like as white as this wall. And I thought, a bit strange. He's not being overly like, you know. And he sat us down. It was very somber. And. And he said, um, OK, I've got some bad news. And then I looked at my husband and he was like, right, then I'm there. Like, oh God. And I was like, oh, God, what's he going to say? And we were like, OK, we both looked at each other. And there was part of me that thought, what have you done? Like your CFO and whatever he says next, your husband, my husband, not that he'd ever blame me, but he would he could just go over to her. So the accountant said, there's been a, a mistake with your tax. The other accountant has not been doing it as it should and we've got an outstanding tax bill and I was like okay my husband looked at me I looked at him and he said the challenge is it's a lot of money and the second challenge is you need to pay it by tomorrow and then the room was just like this somber and I'm sat there and the little the girl the little girl who couldn't do numbers the girl who couldn't do maths, the one who couldn't do money, the one who'd been in debt, the one who decided through imposter syndrome and doubt and all those things that we have, I was like, I need to learn this money. And I said, okay, fine. It's my responsibility. How much is it that we have to pay by tomorrow? And he paused. He was so like, and he said, it's 100K. And I smiled and I went, oh, okay, okay. And I got out of my bag, the checkbook, and I said, do you want me to write a check? And my husband looked at me and I said, oh, that's all right. That's OK. We've got it. And the accountant went, you've got it. I said, yeah, because when the other account, as my business started to make more money, I was looking at the numbers thinking, hold on, we're paying this. But at some point, I'm sure that. So I'd started like a tax pot and was putting money away in the tax pot because it wasn't our money. I thought this is not our money at some point, like. And I'm not a tax man, like I'm, I know nothing really about the ins and outs of tax, but that little calculation, I was like, oh. so I put the money away. So the accountant went, sorry, I said, yeah, I can write a check. So I enjoyed writing the check, but ripped it out in a dramatic fashion. Yeah. Said, there you are. And then he went, oh, okay. I said, anyway, are we going to go for lunch? Should we go for lunch now? Anyway, my husband and I went for lunch. And it was, a, I think what I'm so grateful for was that lunch could have been very different that could have been a conversation about the business closing divorce like the whole thing <laughs> it was, he said to me I didn't know you'd done that and I was like yeah because I'm CFO and um then we were like wow like this stuff works and then that's when I unleashed my like inner money boss 
jobs because then I was like hold on if I can do that and we can do that together like my husband was working really hard getting us out of the business I was working hard to get this money stuff sorted so we had a conversation we're like right if we were unlimited and we had these dreams what would we do and we were like right well we'll get financially free we'll get the business above the seven figures and hey what if we secretly decided we wanted to become millionaires like how would that look and so we planned it and then back engineered it and when the business hit the seven figures the cfo written on there was me and i remember thinking you know if i can go from that little girl to that I really believe any woman can mm. if she surrounds herself with the right people, which is why it's great they're listening to your podcast. Mm. They get mentoring. Um, they believe in themselves and lose the labels. Um, wonderful things can happen. And yeah, and it's just now, then other women started to come and ask me, hey, you seem normal, like the juggle is real and you seem down to earth, but can you teach me? And I'm like, yeah, I can. And I've got this written on my hand, actually, from the event. I, I was going to ask you what, what was yeah, going on. I met this wonderful, wonderful woman, a woman called Anae. And when she was talking to me about her life's mission, she was a fellow speaker. She said, oh, my mission is to go back and get the others. And it resonated with me so, so much because I thought, oh, yeah, I know that's my purpose now. I need to go back and get the others. I need to go back and get the little girls who are bad, who've been told they're bad with numbers. I need to go back and get the women who think they're bad with mass. I need to go back and get the women who think that they can't get out of debt. I need to go back and get the women who think they're staying in relationships because they haven't got any money. I need to go back and get the, the women who want to have a side hustle, want to potentially leave their job. I want to go back and get the women who've got a tiny little seed inside them that's a I want to get more time with my children and have passive income. I want to go back and get the women who want to be financially free. I want to go back and get the women who want to be millionaires, but think that's not for the likes of them. And money is an energy, as we both know. And for me, it's just about the gap. What are you earning? How can you earn more if you want to? How can you earn more working less? And then how can you limit your expenses? So you've got stuff left that there's not more month left at the end of your money, if you get what I mean, like you've got money and then we get that gap and then we take it and we invest it. And for me, it was business, property, investments, intellectual property, selling my knowledge and affiliate that to me was part of the vehicle to achieving my passive income goals. And then what was beautiful was I ended up, my husband thought we were done at two kids, but I really wanted more. And I ended up going on to have two, uh, two girls and life was just completely different. I was able to earn as much, but work when I want with who I want, charging what I want. And the best thing is to say no to the things I don't want to do. I don't have to go and work with that client that I don't want to. I can reset my boundaries. So for example, I'm here as you know, you said in New York for a speaking event, I would have normally said no, 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 because I'm wanted to be mummy and I'd be virtual but now she's a bit older my husband's like hey you should go and I thought okay yeah. I will but yeah everything changed because I changed and removed my labels um and I think for women we all can literally there's no limit to not just how much money we can earn because it's never about the money it's about the freedom the time what we then can give back and and stop sacrificing ourselves stop settling and stop sacrificing our family time anyway I'm really of yeah. the time sorry I love your no I love your message and I love what you're saying and I love what I love that message that um you know go back and get the others and um you know and there's times where um I still feel like there's so much more I could do but I sort of stop myself because I don't want to go back into that juggle and back yeah. into that you know that stressful situation but even your messages today motivates me to go no it's why why settle for less you know yeah. who's to say what is enough for you or for me or for whoever like it, it, it's okay if you want to earn 50 grand a year 50 pound a week 100 grand a year seven figure million business well it's up to you you decide you just got to decide how you're going to get there and I think like you said get the met the mindset the knowledge and the right people around you such an important message Joe. and I don't like we could literally talk probably for another two hours about mindset and about business and about mums and about the juggle and all of that um but I've got a client to go, I've got to go and talk I to. know I know I, I know you have some breakfast because you're on New York time so I am. You, and, you know thank you thank you so much for having me on your podcast um you know I love you I adore what you're doing um and you're just doing such great 
great things. And so to be on your podcast is a real honor. So thank you for having me here. No, no, um, that was all mine. Any woman who's listening, whether it's a side hustle, whether it's just more money, whether it's you want to start a business, grow a business, exit a business, want to get financially free, be a millionaire, you've, you're listening. Rebecca will help you. Oh, and if I get the opportunity to help you as well, then that would just be brilliant. Come and come and, and find I'm, me to connect with you. Yeah, definitely. So what is the best way for people to connect? I'm obviously going to be putting your um, links and your in the show notes so people can go and find you and connect with you. But is there like one main key way that people can connect? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I hang out a lot in on Facebook. So um, the she's you can look up she's a money boss. You can find me there on okay. Instagram. I am I am Joe I am Joe Davison. There's a dot there somewhere, but you can find me there. Or you can just directly email the team team at she's a money boss dot com, um, and you can find me there. But I'll make sure you get some good links that will take you directly there. Yeah, no, just <laughs> wandering across. Oh, if one seems to think that this is the other thing, it's not just kids, is it? It's animals. That juggle, you know. my love, the juggle. Oh, he's all wet and he's going to want to get on my lap. This is going to. Nice. I better go on that note. Um, Joe, will you come back another time and talk? To I would someone? love to. Good, good. And good, also, good. you've got to come on mine. I'm just about to start my "She's a Money Boss" podcast. So oh, uh, amazing. Well, we, we, if you get the links for that, let us know, and we'll update the show notes whenever that might be. Brilliant. Enjoy the rest of the time in New York, Joe. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Take Bye. care. For those listening in September 2023, then Joe does have an event in the UK, um, in London, on the 6th of October. She's a Money Boss Live. I will put the link in the show notes and if you attend via that booking link, then you get a 20% off discount for being part of my audience. So go and check that out and um, see if you're able to make it. If not, then maybe um, if you're listening to this at another time, there may be another event that Joe is running um, at that time. So go and check out her website. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Accelerate Your Wealth. For further help or to connect with Rebecca directly, please head over to the website www.rebeccarobertson.co.uk where you can find further information on our planner, book and how to further maximise your wealth. Our sponsor, Evolution Financial Planning for regulated advice on pensions, investments, mortgages, insurances on www.evolutionfinancialplanning.co.uk forward slash podcast.